Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. I will be back in just a few seconds with Larry Wilkerson, who just recently attended a conference on the climate crisis and how it might affect the U.S. Navy. This is a, was a webinar held by the Navy and the War College. Uh, Larry will tell us more about it in just a few seconds. Anyone that's watched uh, my interviews with Larry Wilkerson, who's the former chief of staff for Colin Powell at the State Department, and he worked with uh, Powell at the Joint Chiefs, uh, been in the military for decades. Uh, anyone that's watched my interviews with Larry will know that he and I are no fans of U.S. foreign policy, no fans of the U.S. military industrial complex. And I would say Larry is one of the most important and outstanding critics of all of that. But all that said, uh, one needs to acknowledge that to a large extent, the U.S. military and maybe particularly the Navy, because maybe they would be the most urgently affected, have been fairly realistic about the threat of the climate crisis. They're, they are not climate science deniers by any means. And in terms of the U.S. government apparatus, uh, maybe they're the most open publicly outside of some of the straightforward environmental agencies uh, about the danger of the climate crisis. Um, they do it from the point of view of how to strengthen and maintain the power of the U.S. Navy. But still, they don't really mince words about how dangerous this situation is. Um, now, let's remember uh, the Republican Party and much of the Democratic Party that claims to be so pro-military uh, has no climate policy that reflects the urgency of the situation, even as it's explained to them and publicly by the Navy. Um, let's not forget, 75 million people in the last election voted for a climate science denier. And the media pays very little attention to the climate crisis unless there's a, you know, a fire. And even when there's fires in California and droughts in the Midwest, sometimes they don't even mention the words climate change. Uh, but Larry Wilkerson went to a conference this morning, uh, as we speak, uh, with the Navy sounding the alarm. And he's going to tell us about it. So, Larry, thanks very much for joining us again. Surely. So what did you hear? I heard that uh, what Michael Clare wrote in his book, All Hell Breaking Loose, is readily acknowledged by all the services, but particularly the Navy, for some of the reasons you just reiterated. The Navy is, after all, on the ocean. The Navy is, after all, almost entirely coastal installations, which are subject to sea rise. And as I found out this morning, as with the Army, Drought is as big a threat to them as sea rise. The Army has even prioritized drought at the top of its threats from climate change. And that's because the surrounding communities in the southwest of the United States in particular are suffering so badly and probably will continue to suffer that the installations located there are going to suffer too. So drought is a very high on the Army's priority and it's high on the Navy's too because a lot of the drought is impacting places like San Diego, for example, which are Navy bastions. Now, I, er, this morning after the webinar, uh, you told me you thought it was so good, you, you, you felt like cheering. So elaborate, what are, what, what are some of the specifics of what you heard? Well, it's so disgusting that the government is doing nothing. The federal government outside DOD is, I shouldn't say nothing, they're doing a lot more than they were five years ago when I first started speaking out on this matter, uh, but they're not doing nearly enough. Biden issued the executive order, for example, that uh, started the Climate Change Corps, which I'm all for. I think finally, in the, at the end of the day, we're going to have to have a draft for that, and we're probably going to have to put 10 to 11, maybe even 12, 13 million people into it, young people into it. Right now, the executive order only calls for volunteers. Well, we know what volunteers do look at the all-volunteer force, <laughs> there's not a volunteer in it. It's all money and, and bribes and so forth. But even with that being done by the Biden administration, I've been appalled at the lack of action on part of the civilian bureaucracy, the civilian leadership. And this morning, uh, I knew the military services were leading. I knew they had long ago put climate change at the top of their threat list. I knew that they viewed it as an existential threat 
I knew that they viewed it as an incredible drain on their budgets in the future, primarily because of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief going up by a factor of 10 times. Um, but I didn't know that they were so methodical about their approach to it. Um, maybe I should have. My time on the Climate Security Working Group would indicate that they were developing that kind of methodology. But it really surprised me this morning how forward-leaning, how much in front of the foxhole the U.S. Navy is. And we were briefed by the Vice Admiral who heads the, uh, he, he's actually the CNO, the Chief of Naval Operations Logistics Expert, and they are, they are framed for climate change. Uh, it, 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 it represents everything from uh, what, what is called drop-in fuel, for example. They want to be able to take a fuel off a barge, for example. Um, the barge would create the hydrogen or create the alternative fuel, and there would be no requirement for that fuel and the apparatus to generate it to be on the warship, to be on the platform that actually fights for the Navy it would be on a barge somewhere and they would pull up to that barge and the hydrogen or whatever it turns out to be would be offloaded into the mechanism of the ship that uses that fuel. Um, all kinds of innovation and working with uh, universities. I was, I was somewhat uh, taken aback when I heard him talk about UVA, University of Virginia and Virginia Tech working with Yorktown, which I used to drive by almost every time I used the old highway when I was teaching at Women Mary. No mention of William and Mary. So I fired off an email immediately to the Virginia Institute of Maritime Studies and to the uh, new Institute for Integrated Conservation at William and Mary. Why aren't you being talked about by Admiral Williamson? This is crazy. You know, UVA's in on it. Virginia Tech's in on it. They're helping. Uh, this is the way it should be. Um, you're not doing anything, apparently, because you weren't even mentioned. Then we moved over to the doctor, Dr. Mark Spector, from uh, the Office of Naval Research, ONR, probably one of the best research entities in the United States of America. And he's talking about, I need academic help. I need help. Come on our website and look at all the projects we're working on. Everything from batteries to alternative fuels to you name it. I need your help. Come on register with us and, and, and help us out. This is what should be happening. Well, the, the military certainly knows how to acquire research and pay for research. And the, the military, and I, including the Navy, although maybe I don't know if, if they're the worst, but, but as a whole, the U.S. military is one of the worst carbon emitters on the planet. Absolutely, and readily admitted to So So what are they, they going to do about that? I mean, it is under their power. They don't need Congress I guess they need funding, but they're getting tons of funding. Are they going to use that money to, to, to actually transition to sustainable? Already are. Every initiative that Admiral Williamson and others, Deborah Loomis, for example, who is the Secretary of the Navy's Special Assistant for Climate Change, just imagine some senator having a Special Assistant for Climate Change. Um, they all talked about this is at, at root to make the Navy a better Navy than any other Navy in the world because we are charged with protecting the seas and protecting the country's commerce and so forth. So we have got to have uh, a, a Navy that can operate in this rapidly changing climate situation. So that's their number one alternative or number one objective, and I have no objection to that. That's their business. But at the same time, they realize they're contributing. So every initiative they're working on is also double-hatted, if you will. It's to make the operational capacity better, and it's also to reduce their contributions to the problems that the operational capacity has to confront, and that is climate change. So they're trying to bring down their signature. They're trying to bring down their carbon emissions. Every initiative has that attached to it to add to the amelioration aspect of what they say is the two-pronged way to go after climate change. Adaptation, because we're so late, we're going to have to adapt to things like sea rise in Norfolk. We can't stop it, not stop it completely, so we've got to adapt. And two, and this is what five years ago I couldn't hear anybody talk about because they were afraid to talk about it. The Congress would reprimand them and maybe even threaten their budget if they talked about it. Amelioration. Because when you talk about amelioration, you have to talk about the human contribution to climate change, of which the Navy and the other services are a great component. 
DOD is, well, I don't know if on a list of nations, would be 55th right beside Portugal or something like that. It gives off a lot of emissions. So they are double-pronged. They're going after the operational capacity, which is essential for the services, and at the same time, they're going after that portion, which is large, and they realize it, of the problem that they're creating. Well, part of what they're creating is, a po- is based on this policy, which is certainly pushed by the Pentagon, of needing this enormous global military footprint to maintain U.S. global hegemony, uh, which to a large extent I think is kind of ridiculous because when's the last time they won a major war and what the hell do all these bases do anyway? I mean, one of the, one of the fastest ways for the military not to be such a carbon emitter is not to be so damn big. <laughs> you make a good point. But you make it for those elements of the military that I would probably agree with your point on. I'm a big fan of the Navy. I went to the Naval War College. I steeped in the Navy, if you will. The history of the United States is the history of the United States Navy in many respects, all the way from John Paul Jones forward. The Navy is an arm of the armed forces which is designed to protect international commerce. And it doesn't confine its protection of international commerce to U.S. commerce. It guarantees freedom of the seas and operational capability on those seas, even to our enemies' militaries, but certainly to our our friends and our enemies and our neutrals' commerce. That's the essence of the Navy. If I had to do away with the United States military, the last aspect of it I'd do away with is the Navy for that very reason. There, it's been argued that the most important clause in our Constitution is not the things we usually cite. It's the Commerce Clause, because that's essentially what we are as a nation of commerce. I wish we were more so even than we are today because we've become a nation of banking and finance more than commerce. But that's what we're supposed to be. That's what we were built to be. That's what Washington and Jefferson and Hamilton and all the founding fathers thought would be the power of this country was commerce. And the Navy was built, and the Navy was put to sea to protect that commerce. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a benign task until it turns hot when you encounter someone who wants to interrupt that commerce, as we did off the coast of Somalia with terrorists who wanted to interdict the commerce through the Red Sea, now far more important than the Persian Gulf. 60% of the world's commerce goes through the Red Sea, through the Bab el-Mandeb and into the Red Sea. The protection of that is the United States Navy. And let me hasten to add, the Chinese Navy, the Italian Navy, soon to be the Turkish Navy probably, the Japanese Navy, the combined task force that dealt with those Somali pirates that were interdicting commerce was joint. It was uh, seven, eight different nations. And now most of those nations are in Djibouti because of that. But if the mission was defending commerce, you probably could get rid of about 75% of it. I mean, how much of it is about you know, posturing around Taiwan. Well, you could certainly, you you got a point there. You you could do something that I think is absolutely essential. And we're going to talk about this in April at the Pritzker Military Institute and Military Museum in Chicago, very prestigious place where we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force. But the panel I'm going to be on is going to talk about technological change and how that could be used to reshape the U.S. military. I was about to say, I, I've heard even neocons say aircraft carriers are simply floating targets that could be taken out at any time. They're boondoggles. And their their offensive purpose is to attack other countries. That, that's really what their offensive purpose is. Now, you could say, oh, no, they protect the other surface ships that protect commerce at sea and so forth. And I would say quickly, submarines can do that. Submarines can do that all day long. And they don't present, other than their ballistic missiles, that threat to onshore countries and people. Um, So, you know, if you wanted to redesign the U.S. military to be more in in concert with what we purport are our missions in the world, you would certainly keep the Navy. You might think about the other services and consider the past. What did we do? We had fairly powerful, big navies, and we had very, very small armies. And we didn't even have an air force. Well, going back to the conference, how, of the various speakers, what were their view of when this is all coming down? 
Uh, you told me earlier, it was pretty scary, some of what you heard. So what, what are they predicting and when? It's here. It's here and they know it. Um, uh, Admiral Williamson talked, for example, about the nation's only naval aviator training space, Pensacola, and having to rebuild it completely now post-hurricane. It was, it was really badly damaged, just as was the base in northern Florida that the Congress wouldn't let the Navy move or wouldn't let the Air Force move, really an Air Force base. They wouldn't let him move it, uh, and it was $4 billion, I think it was $4 billion worth of damage the hurricane did. And, of course, the Air Force wanted to move it. They didn't want to stay there because what's going to happen? It's going to get hit again. But now the Congress, because of, you know, political constituency in Florida, has said, no, you will rebuild it to the tune of 4 or $5 billion. That's crazy. That's insane. They wanted to do something smart. They wanted to move it inland. They wanted to get away from that kind of uh, uh, possibility. But, no, they're not going to be able to. But... They will rebuild it with 10 times more resilience than it had before in terms of the buildings, in terms of how they lay things out, in terms of how, for example, Guam is laid out now. If you've ever been to Guam lately, you know that Guam is an aesthetic nightmare. I mean, that's the way I would describe it. It's been built to withstand 200 knot winds from typhoons. And so everything is built low and lean and austere and it just looks horrible from an aesthetic point of view. Did they paint a picture of what the next 10, 20, 30 years looks like? In a, in a sense, yeah, because they were talking about how conflict is going to run. You're going to have conflict all over the world. You're going to have conflict that is induced by partially initially, as it is now, today, in the global south by climate change. But then you're going to have conflict that is primarily induced by climate change. That is to say, it's going to become so bad that people are going to have to migrate. And we're talking about everything from 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, day after day after day after day, parched land because of that, no water because of that, no crops because of that, and people moving because of that. Yeah, I mean, hundreds of millions of people from the South having to move North. What, is that? what does that mean? It's already happened. You know, we, we sit around, the New York Times sits around and writes about this, and the Guardian even writes about this, and no one says, as you mentioned in your lead-in, no one says, oh, maybe these people are moving partly at least now because of climate change. You think so? Yes, of course they are. If they're coming out of Nicaragua or Honduras or Guatemala, they've had massive hurricane damage down there. They've had drought down there. They've had floods down there. That's why some of these people are leaving, because it's all, it's awfully difficult to live, let alone work and, and, and make a living. Look at Cuba. Cuba had more problems with this last hurricane than it's had with any other hurricane in its past. And Cuba has just loads of experience with hurricanes. When I was down there in 2009 and 10, I got briefings on how they did things, and I wanted to transfer that to Florida and to Texas. The problem was Cuba can say, get out of your house, and people leave. In Florida, you say, get out of your house, and half the people stay. And then you have to go rescue them and risk people's lives doing it. Well, that's our democracy. That's our freedom. But Cuba has a much better way of handling hurricanes, serious hurricanes, than probably anybody else in the Caribbean, and certainly better than us. But they didn't handle this one very well, and they didn't because it was so massive. And they've had a lot of problems with recovering from that, not just the usual problems like they're having with their energy grid and so forth, but all kinds of problems that occurred because of the latest hurricane. So that's, that, that's a problem now. Have you seen the stats on how many Cubans are leaving Cuba? There, it's, it's incredible. It's worse than any boat lift we've ever had. It's, it's worse than all the past immigration. We've changed Jesse Helms and Richard Burton's laws. You, you know, you, you can't just put your foot on U.S. territory and become a U.S. citizen now. You actually have to, because hundreds of thousands of people have left, you actually have to go through some sort of process. Now, they've modified and expedited the process, but you still have to go through the process. But you think this, this increased migration is, is also connected to the climate issue, to the hurricane? Yes, it is. It is partially. It's also part of the blockade we have on Cuba. 
because there are no economic prospects. You notice that President Obama has just, or President Biden has just started re-implementing some of President Obama's policies. For example, we just began to approve uh, Western Union, you know, you can send remittances down to Cuba now if you're a Cuban American living in Florida. You so, couldn't so for a long time. Trump cut it Chomsky, off. Chomsky, but lots of others, uh, climate scientists. I've interviewed people that are authors of the IPCC reports. I mean, they're predicting essentially, and, and, and within, you know, 30, 40 years, 50 years max, and maybe sooner, the, the, these timelines are very actually unpredictable. There's various uh, tipping points in the in the climate structure, where this whole thing could be happening much faster, and and in fact it always is happening faster than the IPCC reports. As soon as an, a report comes out, it's outdated within very short time. The, the the predictions are essentially the end of organized human society. People are using language like that. Does the military get that the threat? is at that level do they talk like that and do they tell their political ma supposed masters that that this is the threat well i don't know what they say in the in the councils of government i suspect they're somewhat limited in the, in the rhetoric they use with president biden and others like him tony blinken jake sullivan and so forth but i don't think people like general milley the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff uh holds anything back and and, and i think the fact that they have put climate change as the number one future threat to the armed forces of the United States ought to make every single doubting American stand up and take notice. Even Marjorie Taylor Greene, asshole that she is. So, so why aren't this they? Is, you, you, can't, you can't be spending a trillion freaking dollars to an instrument that you praise day in and day out, that you have special sessions of Congress to thank. You can't be doing that. And then when they turn around and tell you the number one threat to your existence, lady, is climate change, and, and continue, unless you're warped, and Marjorie Taylor Greene is warped. Well, the, the Republican Party as you and I have discussed, has, has essentially become like a, a, cr a criminal family of, of various forms. And climate science denial just f feeds their base and they don't seem to give a damn about the consequences. The Democratic Party leadership, not certainly the whole party, but the leadership, uh, while they in rhetoric seem to get it, uh, they, 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 and even even this last big bill, this supposed anti thing called I can't remember what's it called, the anti-inflation bill that didn't have anything to do with inflation. It did more than previous bills, but they're not out there pounding this message you heard from the Navy about this is the number one threat. I mean, China supposedly is the number one threat. Russia is the number one threat. You, you don't hear that climate's the number one threat from any of the political circles. Here's a. A little insight into that with regard to the military. Even though the Admiral, the uh, Assistant to the Secretary of the Navy and others kept making the point about operational advantage was gained from being ahead of the power curve, especially the really vicious part of the power curve, like for example sea rise. They kept saying things too, like we're cooperating with Vietnam. We're cooperating with China. We're cooperating with Russia. <laughs> and, and they, there was one really poignant story that one of the uh, lower ranking people told. They had just been, uh, no, it wasn't a lower rank. It was a lower ranking person telling the story, but it was the Secretary of the Navy who went to Fiji over the objections of the White House and the DOD and gave a speech on climate change. They said he should give a speech on China's the threat and all this. He went to Fiji and he gave this speech. When he finished the speech, one of the members of the Fijian audience came up to him and said, thank you very much for doing that. You finally recognize the fact that we're getting screwed out here and we are your allies. You know? And that, that's, the, that, that's it. They went to the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. And they're, this is the Navy now, and they're dealing with the problems that Vietnam is going to confront with the Mekong. 
all of a sudden, one of the Vietnamese from the government, this is a communist government, Paul, and it said, it, he said, um, you know, we've got a lot of students getting their doctorates, and they are coming up with some good ideas. Fast forward, the Navy sat in on the doctoral briefings of those students from Vietnamese universities with the faculty grading the students on the quality of their dissertations in order to see if they could gain more ideas about how to deal with climate change. This, this is what should be happening all over the world. <laughs> you know, this is going to kill us all. You know, we need to be cooperating. We need to be collaborating. And this is what is happening in these esoteric military channels because the military understands at root that this is something everybody has to contribute to. Enemy, friend, Well, was neutral, there any alike. even whisper of the necessity of, of some kind of negotiated settlement to this war in Ukraine for this reason, to get, you know, get this conversation moved over to climate. I think they stayed away from that in this particular webinar because it would have been distracting in terms of the main message they wanted to send. But I, if you got Admiral Williamson or uh, we also had the Royal Navy there in terms of Admiral Paul Beatty, the UK, if you got them aside, you probably would get them to say this is the dumbest thing on the face of the earth. Now, they couldn't say that for political reasons. But, you know, we, just this war is crazy. It's crazy. Yesterday, I also was on a Quincy Institute program, and it was Chatham House Rules, so all I, I won't name anybody or anything, but basically the experts that we brought in to brief us on the Ukraine situation essentially said we're probably looking at two to three years. Think about that for a minute. Two to three years more of war. And then both sides will tire, if, if we can control escalation during those two or three years, and that is a real big question, both sides will look at each other and say, this is really bad stuff. Let's have a negotiated ceasefire. And then we'll have a DMZ, UN peacekeepers, in 75 years, like in Cyprus, like in Pakistan, like on the Indian and Chinese border, like in Korea. We'll have 75 years of demilitarized zone and a negotiated ceasefire. And that's the best we can do. If that's the best we can do, we are certainly hurting in Washington, Moscow, everywhere. And the way the U.S. policy is now is just keep arms at a level that the Ukrainians can't lose. Don't give arms at a level that would actually threaten the Russians, you know, getting completely nuts. So this goes on and on and on. Yeah, but the talk now with this main battle tank business and this pressure on Germany to give Leopards to them and on the UK to give Centurions to them and on us to give Abrams to them, which is, is pressure from the military industrial complex, I guarantee you, is indicative of how it could escalate anywhere in that two or three years before we get to a stalemated uh, ceasefire. And it's a cash cow. I mean, that's Lockheed Martin's dream to have this go on and on and on. And look, they're making money off the munitions going to Ukraine and then making a double hit off the munitions going back into the U.S. and our allies' stockpiles that got depleted because of the munitions going to Ukraine. I mean, this is nirvana for them. This is and, heaven. And on Putin's side, he'd rather this go on forever in order to avoid the humiliation of a deal that ends up back in February 23rd, because then what the tens of thousands of Russian soldiers die for. So it's an insanity on both on all sides. It is. It, this whole situation is insane. It's utterly insane, but it's very profitable. Very profitable. It's profitable for Putin, too. If you look at how sanctions have forced other countries to line up with Russia with regard particularly to petroleum, but other things, too, it's profitable for them also. Unlike what we say, because we like to think our sanctions are working, they aren't. So just before we conclude the interview, Larry, is there anything else that came up at that climate, Navy climate uh, webinar that we should hear? Well, there's one powerful message coming forth from the individual in charge of for the Navy, and I got the impression a wider writ within DOD 
um, what's called vector control or vector analysis. It's disease is what it's about. It's, it's pandemics. It's um, uh, things like Ebola, Zaire. It's, it's really dangerous uh, operations within the global climate with regard to disease and the passing of disease from population to population. And it was somewhat frightening, the charts he put up, and he talked about this is what we're doing in the so-called global south. We're using these pesticides. This is what we're doing with these pesticides. And this is how what we're doing with these pesticides is adding to the drama and the depth and profundity of climate change. And at the same time, to the ultimate problem they're going to have raising any kind of edible food. Um, not don't 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 just mention drought, but all this other stuff too. And then talk about the vectors coming out of this. Vector control in the army was essentially controlling rats because they spread disease, as you well know, the bubonic plague and things like that. Well, vector control now is not just rats; it's all these things coming out of places that wouldn't have come out of there had the heat not gotten to the level it's gotten to, had the rapacious uh, predatory capitalism not ripped apart the terrain the way it has, and had we not had some of these uh, policies and practices in place that are there because we've robbed them of the capacity to have higher tech solutions to their problems. And so they're going back to really, really bad pesticides and things like that to take care of their problems. All of this is a part of the way, in, in Fiji it was said to the uh, SECNAV, as it was reported on this webinar, you know, most of this is your fault. Bingo, <laughs> bingo. It's not the Pacific Islanders fault. It's not Palau's fault. It's not Micronesia's fault. It's not Kiribati's fault. It's our fault. Hey, we're your allies. What are do, you doing? Does, does the Navy, correct, does the Navy say fault? this stuff to congressional committees? I mean, do they talk like? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. It's a good question. Do they are they as candid with their congressional oversight as they were with us on this webinar? I don't know. I hope they. Well, maybe are. you can find out, and we can talk about. I can this. tell you, I've been that. I've been that candid with members of Congress, and some react, and some don't. The majority being in the latter category. Well, it'd be good and interesting uh, to find out because, uh, you know, in theory, they should have public hearings and, and, the, and the various committees in the House and the Senate that oversee the military should hear this stuff. And if they have, it's, 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 I guess it's understandable why they ignore it because all they care about is their funders who don't seem to care about this. But On Monday, I'm going over to the Hill with Major General Leach to talk with uh, several members about some of these issues, including the all-volunteer force. I'll make that a point. Of yeah. Questions. All right. Thanks very much, Larry. And thank you sure. all for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget, there's a donate button at the top of the web page. There is a subscribe to the email list on our web page. And on YouTube, uh, you can su subscribe on YouTube. You'll get supposedly get notices. I think a lot of people say they subscribe on YouTube, and YouTube doesn't send them, send them notices. And our audience on all the various pod uh, podcast platforms is probably even bigger, is bigger, significantly bigger, actually, than our YouTube audience. So if you're listening on the podcast platform, come on over to the website and, and get on the email list. And thanks for joining us.